All right, let's watch the CG CGP Grey video, the most dangerous. The Constitution says, when the president dies, who becomes the president? Well, the Constitution says what happens next is the vice president assumes the powers and duties of the office. Simple enough, but one backup president is none backup president. So what happens next next? The Constitution left this question as homework for the new Congress. Important homework, yes, due date, no. So Congress sort of worked on succession with inconsistent and conflicting drafts, but mostly procrastinated on properly finishing for 200 years, finally turning in the 25th Amendment. Better late than never, though in the meantime a president had died in office not once, not twice, not thrice, not quadrice, not quintice, not hexice, nor septice, but octagonal ice. For natural causes, for- Okay, bitch, we get it. You know words. All right, uh, just stop flexing assassinations. It was Garfield and McKinley. This survival record was only 80%, and even counting to today, the president is technically the most deadly job in America. But the odds are, when you become president, you must roll the celestial 2d6, and if you roll a 7, you die in office. Woof. Don't spend a lot of time in Vegas with those odds. So the Veep becomes the peep and picks a new Veep who must be confirmed by a majority vote of both houses of Congress. If this happens quickly, then hunky-dory. Everything is reset. But getting a Veep nominee approved might take some time, during which the former VP, who is now the president, who is not immortal, must cast the dice and could roll a seven. The office of the vice president has been vacant for more than a baker's dozen of times in United States history, which, given the historical state of Congress's homework at the time, put the peaceful transfer of power in a precarious position. For example, the first time a president died in office, the ninth, by the way, didn't even make it to double digits, no one knew what should happen. The then VP just grabbed a judge to administer the oath of the president to become number 10, and spent the rest of his term arguing with Congress and the nation about if he was really the president president or the acting president. Which seems a little, who cares, what's the difference? But there is the office of the president and there are the powers and duties of the office, which are not quite the same thing. See, it's not just death that can remove a president. A president can resign, a president can be impeached, and a president can be enabled to discharge the powers and duties of the office. This last enable is from the Constitution, which makes no attempt to define what enable means. A president can volunteer themselves to be enabled, for example, during physical illness, upon which they don't leave the office, but the VP gets the powers and duties of the office and becomes acting president. This, on a tiny scale, has happened a few times when the president has under gone non-trivial surgery ronald reagan right and then who got the colonoscopy a reason for this being to ensure nuclear weapons command and oh, control Bush. is maintained at all times. So don't get any ideas. But also, you don't get any ideas. I'm still the president. Power reverts as soon as this is over. And it will, assuming death doesn't make a bedside visit. Anyway, inability is a subjective sliding scale. A president could be perceived it's as- It's not life-threatening colonoscopy, you weirdo. It's that he had to undergo anesthesia and therefore was incapable of assuming the- like, and, and doing, like, presidential roles if, let's say, nuclear war broke out while he was un undergoing uh, anesthesia. Like, that's why. It doesn't have to be fucking life-threatening. It's just that you're, you're going under mentally enable by some or become so mentally enable as to be unable to declare themselves also this didn't happen even though it should have happened under reagan this what he's i mean thinking of like contemporary presidents like you literally could make this argument about ronald reagan enable or become physically enable yet simply refuse to declare it here the 25th amendment allows for the vice president to perform a kind of gentle coup okay the president has 15 top level advisors we will get to later if the vp can get a majority of advisors to state in writing the president is enable the vp gets the powers and duties of the office the president can challenge this getting a moment to try and consolidate keys to power but if the vp and advisor reaffirm the president is indeed enable, the VP is acting president, and a 21-day countdown clock begins. What happens next is up to Congress. If they do nothing, when the clock runs out, presidential power returns to the president. But if within the 21 days, Congress votes with a two-thirds majority that the president is enable, then the vice president is permanently acting president. And the president is still around? Awkward. 
Obviously, this would be a real delicate maneuver for any VP to pull off, particularly as the president can dismiss their advisors for any reason as long as the president holds the powers and duties of the office. So getting advisors on board would be challenging. Case in point, in 1919, the president suffered a stroke and was mostly blinded and partly paralyzed. Don't worry, no big deal, the president just doesn't want to talk to the public or meet with his VP or consult with his advisors or leave the White House at all for a year and a half. And during this time, there was no move by the VP to declare the president unable. But there might be a way around the VP. The 25th has this line about Congress appointing, like, its own committee to determine the president unable. But the way it's worded it is a little unclear. Does it mean the VP and advisors or Congress committee determine inability, or does it mean the VP and advisors or Congress committee? If the latter interpretation, that means Congress alone has the power to appoint a committee with the power to remove the power of the president, unilaterally. But as always with unclear interpretations, were they to happen for realsies, someone might want to weigh in on it. So those are the four or five ways a president can get removed from office. But one of them is clearly the most popular, so let's talk about what the finished congressional homework says about succession. First, the doubt that began with President 10 is dispelled by the 25th. When the president dies, the vice president becomes the president president. In able equals VP acting president, dead equals VP president president. But if if both the president and the vice roll sevens, the order of succession is set. And first up is the speaker, who is yep. the- Nancy motherfucking Pelosi, slay queen. Absolute slay queen. Real girl power shit, dude. If that were to happen elected leader from within the House of Representatives. And next is the president pro tempore of the Senate, who is the longest serving senator. Not automatically, but elected by tradition. Do you know? Isn't that such a weird take when like, when the fucking, when the president and the VP dies and, and like, let's say the, uh, the, the speaker of the house is also dead. Then they're like, let's, let's make the oldest guy that's a funny thing to mention now. I'm sure it won't matter later. Senators tend to serve for a long time, so the president pro isn't wait. Actually, I don't know. Isn't isn't pro tempore the uh, uh of the Senate right now? Isn't that? Hold on. Oh, it's Chuck Grassley. <laughs> yeah. The current president pro the current president pro tempore of the Senate is Chuck Grassley and before that it was Orrin Hatch and um he is like you might know you might know uh our Iowa Republican from famously famously refusing to take a COVID test <laughs> recently despite being like a gajillion years old like literally 700 years old. And he's like, no, I'm not going to take a fucking test. Fuck you. Pro tempore is often in their 80s, with the record holder being 98. Just worth noting, it was up to Congress to set succession order and- 98? just so happened to pick the two most powerful members of Congress as next in line from the VP. After Congress, succession moves to the cabinet. These are the advisors mentioned before. Each here has the title of secretary and are secretary of a same-name department. Explaining each in detail would take too long because it would be to explain the entire structure of the executive branch, which is enormous. And some of their names give you the idea, but some of them don't. For example, number four in line, the secretary of state. Someone just brought up something really funny. If people can't vote for 18 years after birth, they shouldn't be able to vote for 18 years before death. LMAO. Imagine if you, uh, imagine if you instituted a, a, a cap on like an age limit on, on who can vote on the other side and adjusted to, and adjusted to the average life expectancy of the United States. It's fucking nuts. So it's 78. So what that would mean is like anyone over 60, anyone over 60 years old would not be able to vote. Like a maximum age cap.
and also i mean shouldn't that shouldn't that also mean that like if there's an age cap of 35 to be president doesn't that also give you a max age cap of like running for president uh which would be the uh which would be the maximum age minus 35 adjusted to the adjusted to the uh the 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 average life expectancy of like what, what would it be like 40 45 or something or 43 yeah 44 year olds would not be able to run Thirty-five to sixty is an acceptable presidency window, dude. That would be so sick. That would actually, I think we would eliminate a lot of problems. I'm not even fucking kidding. Like the more I think about it, the more I'm like, that would literally solve so many issues. I've never thought about that. Modern problems require modern problems require modern solutions, dude. Not having a single fuck in Senate over the age of 60 would be so tight. When the president gets too old, we should throw them off a cliff like on Midsommar. <laughs> what, and then bash their skull like also in Midsommar if it doesn't take. Hey, yo, our president is finally tested negative for COVID. A cause for celebration. Isn't that, is that what that was called? The Atestupa? <sighs> I just spoiled a part of Midsommar for you. Your brief take on Uruguay as a country? I have no take on it, dude. State who runs the Department of State, which has nothing to do with the states, but everything outside the states. The Secretary of State is first in the cabinet because managing the foreign relations of the federal government is a pretty big deal that requires you to be on at least decent speaking terms with other countries. A good thing should say you need their support during a sudden transition of power. The Secretary of State is first among the founding four appointed by the first president. The others, Secretary of Treasury, Secretary of War, and Secretary of Justice. Oh wait, Fancy Pants here wants to be called the Attorney General, but just so happens to be in charge of the Department of Justice. So the oldest departments have their secretaries in 4567 order of succession. Now, from here, Congress decided the rest should continue on seniority, not for people, but departments, which has led to an interesting order. Secretary of the Interior is next up because in the 1800s, young America realized she had a lot of interior land to manage and created the Department of the Interior to manage the land and the Indians on the land. No, there's no time. And land needs to be farmed and managed, so the Department of Agriculture. And then in 1900s, part one, America wanted to develop commerce and labor and part. Okay, this is so boring, dude. Like, how the fuck did CGP Grey turn something that was already, I mean, this is already a really boring uh, take, but. Uh... To health and human services and housing and urban development and oh right transportation between those urban developments oh and energy for those developments and overseeing nuclear weapons there really isn't time and education meanwhile that department of war renamed department of defense created veterans and so also the department of veterans affairs all done until 2001 department of homeland security so the order is more historical happenstance order, not legislators sat down and thought it through. Was there not, not a to cast shade on the Secretary of Education, but if something has happened where the first 15 backups are out of order, that sounds a lot like a homeland security issue. In addition to the debatable order, for everyone below VP, if their spot in succession comes up, they are required to resign their current position to become, wait for it, acting president, most likely serving the rest of the president's term. Why most likely? Well, one of Congress's homework attempts raises an issue called bumping with this paragraph, saying the acting- Bitch, I'm not the only one who thought this was boring. Like, 
fucking 3,000 people left since I started watching this video. The rest of the term, unless a prior entitled individual is able to. Oh, it's another interpretation problem. This does or doesn't mean new appointees take priority and bump those lower on the list out of the office instantly. Here's the worst case interpretation and scenario. Imagine while Congress is on recess, the President, VP, both leaders of Congress, and the Secretary of State all roll sevens. The Secretary of Treasury becomes acting president and appoints a new Secretary of State, who is higher on the list, bumping the acting treasurer president off, who is now unemployed, at least until reconfirmed. And of course, a new Secretary of State is needed post haste, confirmed. Back from recess, the Senate elects a new president pro tempore, who is higher on the list and then must resign to be become acting president, bumping the current acting president who was the secretary of state but is now just unemployed. And then the house elects their new speaker bump again. While there is debate about bumping constitutionality, the point is it's still president 10 all over again. Uncertainty is the whole problem. After a government decapitation, just the potential of rapid fire changes in power is exactly what you don't want to be even debatable when nuclear command and control is on the table in what would obviously be trying times. So maybe a couple more revisions on that homework or do? But whatever, this is the current order. And since the 1950s, for no particular reason, it's been policy to never let all of these people in a room together at once. So when you're watching the next State of the Union address, if you want something to occupy your mind during all the clapping, you can play Guess Who's the Designated Survivor, knocking down successors as you spot them to figure out who isn't there, secreted away in a secure location to be the final backup. Yeah, that's the only cool part about it, or only weird part, rather. Uh, but kind of cool is the designated survivor during the State of the Union address. Damn, Hassan Abi always shits on educational shit is boring. Dog, I literally spend every fucking waking moment talking about, like, educational content leading all the way up to the first, like, four to five hours of every stream. I don't know what you want from me.